My name is Joel. Um, I'm a co-founder of 3 Box Labs, the creators of Ceramic. Uh, and when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about since I'm here for this Falcon conference, when I was like started thinking about these concepts. And I think first time kind of hearing about this ecosystem was at DevCon 1, uh, the Ethereum conference in London, like 2015. And there, Juan just introduced IPFS and some of these concepts that later started to become Falcoin. And so it's really uh, amazing how far the community has gone, and it's really fun to be a part of it. So today I'm going to be talking about composable data uh, and why it's important for the Web3 ecosystem. So a lot of data already exists in our ecosystem and other, like generally in the Web3 ecosystem, on Filecoin, on Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tezos. We've created a lot of like data interactions, primarily financial, but also starting to be some more general data things on blockchains. And we, uh, but they're segregated sort of across different blockchains. And we end up having like multiple wallets and different blockchains. If you've been in this space for a while, you sort of most likely have a wallet on Falcoin, maybe on Ethereum, and so on. Uh, and the data is sort of like segregated across. We have started getting some like bridges between different blockchains for like sending tokens, but data is sort of very segregated still. Uh, and important to think about here is that it, within these ecosystems, like within Falcoin, within Ethereum, there's rich social um, and reputational context within these uh, sort of graphs of interactions. Um, but they're lo still locked in. Uh, and uh, Web3 developers in general just like, like composability. Uh, it would be great if I could take my Ethereum profile when I come to an app in the Falcon ecosystem and just like carry my data around. But we don't really have that sort of shared metadata uh, layer for the entire Web3 space as it currently stands. Uh, and that's something that we could really improve on. Um, Let's see. So I think the way I think about this and what we can achieve is something which I think about as composable identity. So what if I could take all my different wallets, sort of link them together privately, and have the ability to selectively disclose that these accounts are associated to my sort of uh, pseudonymous identity? Um, and sort of like bring all the data associated with that identity across uh, applications that are in different ecos blockchain ecosystems. And what do we do with this sort of like identifier? I don't think we have if we can do this. Well, we probably want to build some sort of web of trust. So web of trust is something that's been tried and sort of has small deployments already uh, in PGP, for example. And there you sort of have to have these sort of ceremonies when you meet each other, uh, you sign each other's keys, but it's not really something that everyone is going to want to do because it's like complicated and you don't really understand why you need to do this thing. Um, so the web of trust that we have today uh, for PGP hasn't really been able to scale because it's like not really socially scalable. Uh, but what is socially scalable, I think, is like people interacting online. Uh, everyone is, a lot of people are like right now on online platforms. Uh, and what if all of the actions, like you make comments, you make proposals, you interact in various ways online, what if all of those were signed and associated to your digital, digital identity? Uh, well, I think if we can do that, we can sort of create an emergent web of trust that just comes out of all of our interactions. Uh, and we can start to think about identity as being something interpersonal, about like the relationships between people uh, and kind of sort of the context online. Uh, and we can start to map only, not only like on-chain financial data, but like actually data that's off-chain, uh, but signed and verifiable uh, in this matter into this sort of like graph that turns into this reputational context. Um, all right, so how do we do this? Well, and, and what are sort of like, the, or why do we actually need to do this? Well, if you think about DAOs and DeFi applications and like various sort of like Web3 projects right now, uh, DAOs have like a treasury that's on chain. Uh, so like the financial stuff is managed in a trustless manner. But generally, we fall back on like Discord, Twitter, Telegram to coordinate our actions. And this is a big problem because, like, first of all, these, these sort of Web2 applications can be censored sort of like arbitrarily. Uh, but worse than that is that we don't actually know that what my friend said on this platform is what he actually said. 
someone could have hacked into the platform, the platform itself could have sort of changed what uh, uh, my friend allegedly said. I have no way of like actually verifying that that's actually my friend who said that. Uh, and we have the solution for this in, in the Web3 space because in the Web3 space, everyone sort of has wallets and public key cryptography. Uh, so I can sign something uh, with my private key and anyone who has my public key can verify that uh, piece of information. So now when my, my friend makes a comment, as it provides a signature, I can verify it's actually coming from my friend. Uh, so we should start to just like sign all the different actions we do online and will it enable us to have this much more trust in like the interactions. Um, and if we put this data into something like IPLD, which is like the data structure of IPFS and Falcoin, uh, we can sort of build these completely uh, self-certifying data structures that I can synchronize the data structure, I verify it, and I can be sure that that's actually uh, the state of the data that I was expecting. Uh, and so, sure, you can put these data structures on centralized web systems, but I think more interestingly, if you put them into peer-to-peer -peer systems, uh, we can sort of have a way more resilient uh, uh, application base for the internet. Uh, and so, uh, this is what we're doing with ComposeDB on Ceramic. So, ComposeDB is uh, the first graph database that's built on top of Ceramic. And it provides sort of these three layers, like GraphQL APIs, uh, sort of general database layer, and the bottom layer is sort of powered by ceramic event streams. Um, so I'll sort of like quickly run through these different uh, pieces and to give you a better understanding of how it works. So the core building block of ComposeDB is a data model. Uh, a data model is created um, using the, the GraphQL schema definition language. And it basically maps onto a JSON schema that you can use uh, to verify the integrity of like, your data. Um, so you can see bottom, bottom right here uh, how we'd actually do that, what the syntax looks like. Um, and the data model is created by um, a developer. You can have relations between these models. So the model here uh, on top, you can see sort of like a proposal. So imagine the yellow model on top is a, is a proposal. Then the one below is a comment, and you can see the comment has like a pointer up to the which sort of like proposal it relates to. Uh, and the nice thing here is that I can actually make a query on the proposal and give me back also all the related comments. Uh, and the neat thing about these data models is if application A makes like the proposal and comment data model, application B can actually pull that into their application. And application B maybe wants to also have like upvotes on comments. Uh, so you can implement that as like a third data model. Um, and now, if someone in application B like creates comments or upvotes or what, whatnot, uh, both of the proposals and comments will also be visible in application A. So we have this sort of like shared layer of data between applications, which is something we haven't really had on Web 2. Uh, it's quite different and quite unique to the Web 3 ecosystem. Um, and the cool thing here also is that when a user comes to an application, they write data to these data models. There's no access control on who gets to write. So anyone can write this sort of like this open thing, which really enables for much greater like um, collaboration on, on data sets and on, uh, on a, in applications. And the reason this works is that the data is not actually written to the data model itself. It's written to an event stream that's con completely controlled by the user. So the user remains in like, full control over their data. Um, and of course, like, as an application developer, you can choose like, which subset you can consider, like, curate which data you actually want to display in your application. In ComposeDB, data models are grouped into something called composites, which is basically a convenient bundle. So you can take composites of the internet, you can merge them, you can sort of like pull things out of them, and uh, then you can take these models and plug them into your uh, ceramic node and basically index that data. Uh, and so, so th this is really kind of like a key part of, of ceramic and ComposeDB, that you can uh, build indexes on subsets of data. So for example, uh, Gitcoin has their passport on Ceramic. Uh, once they migrate to ComposeDB, you'll be able to spin up your own Ceramic node um, and synchronize the, Compose, uh, sorry, <laughs> the, the Gitcoin passport uh, data. And now you essentially have uh, 
a copy of like all of the Sybil resistance data that Gitcoin has, and maybe you can make your own like uh, quadratic voting or something like that uh, based on the same sort of data set. And if your application actually writes uh, new uh, passports into there, they will also be visible in Gitcoin. So you have this like great composability you haven't really seen before in uh, on the internet with sort of like user data. Uh, and all of this is based on something uh, which is like the fundamental building block in Ceramic, which is called an event stream. So an event stream is an independently verifiable event log. Um, and the, the core difference here from a blockchain is that an event stream can be synchronized and verified without caring about any of the other state in the network. So in a blockchain, traditionally, you need to synchronize all of the history to be able to know what the state of a smart contract is. In Ceramic, you can synchronize one event stream without caring about anything else in the network. So that is really what enables Ceramic to scale way beyond sort of like what blockchains can currently do and like sort of get beyond the fundamental limit of uh, block producers in Ceramic. Sorry, block producers in blockchains. Um, the event streams also have this sort of like wallet native auth. So you can authorize with Ethereum, uh, wallets. Uh, we have preliminary support for Solana, but it can easily be extended to Filecoin and Tesos and like whatever blockchains uh, you might want to support. And the way that works uh, right now, if you've used a, a ceramic application, uh, for example, like Gitcoin Passport, you get this sign in with the Ethereum message. Uh, and essentially, the application generates a session key. This session key uh, and the application then like ask the user for permission to use this session key to write to some of your event streams. Uh, and if the user signs this message, uh, the application can then use this session key to write to your event streams on your behalf. So instead of like having to author every action, it's like clicking in MetaMask, like, hey, OK, I approve this comment or this like or whatever, you actually just like approve the application to write on your behalf for some amount of time. Uh, and this, this methodology is called uh, object capabilities, and they can also be like redelegated. So it's, it's a really powerful thing, and it really enables us to have this sort of like uh, authorization also across multiple different blockchains. Uh, the event streams themselves are made up. You can see it's sort of like the, the event stream data structure, um, bottom right. And you have a Genesis event that creates the event stream. Then you have uh, anchor events, which is basically timestamping things into the blockchain. A proof is essentially a vector commitment that uh, this previous event was published at some point in time, and you have a proof on the blockchain. Uh, and then you can make signed events that it contains like payload information uh, and make basically updates to, to your data structures. All of this sort of data structure is stored into IPLD, uh, which is like the underlying um, data schema for. BFS and Filecoin, so sort of natively um, interacts with both Filecoin and IPFS. Uh, and the cool thing is, as I mentioned, you can verify this event stream by yourself if you synchronize it from the network. And these event streams are synchronized over a peer-to-peer peer, uh, peer -peer network. Um, uh, and then it's sort of like up to each application to choose how they interpret the data inside of these event streams. Uh, so for example, in ComposeDB, uh, we interpret this, um, these events as creating a document, updating a document, or removing a document. But you can really imagine using these event streams for a bunch of different things. For example, you could build compute data pipelines. Maybe you have like a bunch of IoT sensors that produces data. Uh, the IoT devices sign these pieces of data, and someone takes that data, runs some computation on top, and then outputs, uh, like an up, up the out, like, outputs the output of the data, uh, also in an event stream, then you can imagine like multiple of these uh, sort of like computational steps. Maybe you have like, uh, you could also imagine uh, you make a deal with a Falcon miner uh, that basically, instead of saying, hey, I want to store this particular file, uh, you can say, hey, store all files that I refer to in this event stream. Uh, and you can sort of actually build more dynamic ways of interacting with, with the Falcon network. Um, so all of these sorts of like possibilities of event streaming go, goes way beyond just like um, composed to be in graph databases. Um, and so what do we build once we have this sort of more easy to use way of building applications uh, using Ceramic and using composed to be? 
Uh, well, I think the first things we should and like could focus on is the DAO ecosystem. It's like tooling around DAOs, essentially like how, how we manage tasks, bounties, whatnot, discussions we have around proposals and things like that. What, if we can put that into this sort of like self-certifying data structures like Ceramic, uh, you will be able to stop relying on centralized sort of applications uh, and be on the whim of them. Because like, if your Discord forum uh, is gone, you're sort of like going to scramble to coordinate all of your community uh, to, with your DAO. Uh, but if you have this in a verifiable data structure, actually multiple community members might be running a backup of your data. Um, and even if half of them goes offline, it's sort of fine. You can easily recover. Social media, I think, is something that's going to be uh, we're probably not going to re-implement whatever the Web2 social media giants did. We're probably going to do something much cooler, better, probably manage y people's attention in a more sort of like humane way. Um, maybe have like dashboards or something that enables us to really see uh, what matters to us. Um, one, one use case that I'm really excited about is sort of civic science and civic collaboration. So. Uh, there's a bunch of projects, especially in DSI, that focus on like building knowledge graphs. So that could be graphs about scientific discourse or graphs about like how do we build uh, a Dyson sphere and like mapping out all the different technologies that are needed to get there. Um, so ma these knowledge graphs, of course, needs to be stored somewhere, and ideally we can see like who contributed what. So. Um, if someone made a really valuable scientific contribution 10 years ago, we should be able to reward them because we realized that now it's actually super valuable. So because things, because if you store like this data in Ceramic, you have actually this verifiable event log, it's tied to your blockchain address, and you will be able to like easily, really easily reward the participants that contributed. Um, similarly, like civic uh, collaboration, this project like uh, civic abundance that builds sort of like dashboards for cities where you see like the most important metrics of your city uh, and anyone can sort of like contribute to making it better. Um, and the cool thing here is we can also build up reputation as we uh, sort of interact in these different applications and it doesn't need to be tied to like any real world identity. It can be tied to some completely pseudonymous identifier, which I think is super important for us uh, to actually make crypto work uh, in a sort of like a non-oppressive way. Uh, and finally, we can take all this data uh, across multiple applications. We have this composability aspect, both on like the database layer, but also on this event streaming layer, uh, which can really like enables us to do much more with, with the data that we're generating as we're using all these Web3 applications of the future. All right, uh, if you're interested in learning more uh, or playing around with ComposedDB, we have our documentation at ComposedDB.js.org. And you can also join our Discord community. Um, all right, thank you, everyone.